hey, how would you like four keys to gladness today? Like right now, four ways you can experience gladness of soul and heart and life, genuine, authentic reasons to rejoice. Stay with me. I'm Pastor Kerry. This is Growing in the Gospel. And just ahead is four reasons for gladness out of Psalm 122. Welcome to Growing in the Gospel. On the channel, we're doing Revelation, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We're doing the Gospel of John, chapter by chapter. We're doing Psalms. And today we're in Psalm 122. And also on Mondays and Tuesdays, we're doing the one-year Bible journey. And we are approaching the halfway point of that journey. And I thank you for joining me today and for letting me teach you the Bible. We are in what's called the Psalms of Ascent. And we get to start a new psalm today. And I love it when we get to do that. To do that. This is a nine-verse psalm. And the theme of this psalm is worship and Jerusalem. And as we get further into the psalm, we're going to talk about the city of Jerusalem Uh, the city of God and the significance that that city has scripturally. And it's ironic that all throughout history and even to this very present day, Jerusalem is the center of conflict uh, and the center of tensions around the world. It's the epicenter. It's the center of the target for Satan because it's the center of the target for the promises of God. So welcome, my friends. Open your Bible with me to Psalm 122, and let's remember where we are. These are the Psalms of Ascent, songs of degrees, maybe your Bible says. What are the Psalms of Ascent? They're the songs that the people of Israel sang as they made their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Three times a year, God ordained that the people of Israel would come together in a, in a, in a, in a massive family reunion. They would bring their offerings. They would make atonement for their sins. They would declare their faith in their God and their covenant relationship with him. And they would come together then with all of their food and their abundance and their blessing and and in a foreshadowing of the kingdom of God on earth, they would have a feast. They would festivate. And I love it because God commanded them to do this. <laughs> it's kind of like commanding your kids to celebrate Christmas and open their gifts on Christmas morning. Or it's like your boss commanding you to take your bonus uh, or your year-end bonus. Or, or it's like the uh, t- tax authority commanding you to take your, your refund or your vacation. You know, it's so funny to think that God would command us. He ordained for us to enjoy him. He's fun. He's enjoyable. He's the fullness of gladness. In his presence is fullness of joy. And so there was no happier moments in the nation of Israel than when everybody went back to Jerusalem. And there's three major feast seasons. Now, there's more than one feast because some of the seasons had a feast at the beginning and a feast at the end. Three major feast seasons that God ordained, and then a fourth that was added later. Jesus celebrated all four of them. So in the spring is Passover, and that looks back on God's deliverance and looks forward for ancient Israelites on the ultimate deliverance that Jesus would bring by shedding his blood. And we look back on what Jesus did to on the cross to save us, and we look forward to his coming kingdom because he, he said uh, at the Last Supper, this is now my body and my blood. It's no longer about the Passover of Egypt, from Egypt. It is now about the death and the shedding of the blood of Jesus for our behalf and for our sins. And then Jesus said, I'm not going to do this again until we do it together in the kingdom. So this is a a great significance, this Passover feast. And and it really foreshadows that that, that feast when we get into uh, his presence. So the Passover, then there's Pentecost. And that was the, the summer, the early summer feast. It was like the the first harvest feast, the celebration of bringing the first fruits to God and honoring him with the first of what he gives us. And still to this day, he calls us as believers to honor him with the first of everything that he gives us for his kingdom, for his purposes. And so that was a feast. And then in the fall, there was the feast of trumpets that then uh, led cr- uh, quickly, that was a short one, but that led quickly into the Feast of Tabernacles. I like to call it the Festival of Tents because they camped all around Jerusalem. They lived in little tents. They lit up the temple grounds 
uh, and they feasted and enjoyed. The, 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 the harvest now is coming to an end, so this is like the final harvest, and it's their abundance, and they're celebrating all the provision of God and all that he brought to them and gave to them and how he took care of them for another year. So these were just the high points. Packing up the village, packing up the family, the kids would have anticipated it. This was like family vacation, family reunion, family feasting, all you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, spring break, and summer vacation, all wrapped into one. And it was what God said to do. God wanted them to do this. He wanted them to rest. He wanted them to celebrate. He wanted them to be full of gladness. He wanted them to enjoy the journey together as a family through this broken life. They're surrounded by enemies always, but they come together and they feast in Jerusalem. So it's just such a great picture. And these are the songs for the road. These are the songs they sang on the trip. Uh, When I was a kid, we'd take long trips. I, I lived in the Atlanta area for a while and we'd drive north to Baltimore where I was born. You say, well, I thought, I thought you were from California. I, I, we moved around a lot, but I lived a lot of my adult life in California. But my childhood was Baltimore, Maryland, and then Atlanta, Georgia, and then, and then the West Coast. So um, we would drive that East Coast drive up, up uh, 85 and then 95 and, and into uh, Severna Park and Glen Burnie. And we would play all kinds of games. We'd play bingo. We'd, we'd play, you know, we'd we'd call the you know certain types of cars out and we'd we'd compete with each other just anything to pass the time you know (laughs) and certain colors of cars and and any anything we could do we'd play we'd sing songs we'd play uh, music so this is what they did to pass the time these were songs to pass the time but they were songs that instructed them for their pilgrimage and so these were like a manual a guidebook for the journey and that's why these songs are so great for us today because you and I are on a pilgrimage. God wants it to be filled with gladness in spite of the sorrowful narrative that's all around us. And he wants to be with us on the journey. Um, there's a book that's written about these Psalms. And if you like to read, uh, there's also an audio version of the book. It's simply called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And it's written by Eugene Peterson. And I've read it a time and a half. Uh, I'm planning to get through it the rest of it. But it's a really good book, and it challenges you along these lines of the pilgrimage. And one of the things that Peterson says at the very beginning of the book is that there's two words that define us as Christians, comprehensively define us as Christians in this life of following Jesus. Number one, we are disciples. And that means we are learners, and we are learning. We're being mentored by our master, Jesus. We're being transformed. We're being taught, and we're growing. We're We're being sanctified. And taught to be more like him. His spirit is teaching us. His word is teaching us. And we are works in progress. We are under construction. It reminds me of that song. I think the Gaithers used to sing it. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun and the earth and the Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. Uh, Let me see if I can remember the the verse. There really ought to be a sign upon my heart. Don't judge me yet. There's an unfinished part. But I'll be perfect just according to his plan, fashioned by the master's loving hand. Hey, do you like that? He's still working on me to make, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. So, Uh, Philippians, being confident, Paul said, I'm confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So no reason, my friend, for you to lose hope or despair or to get frustrated even with yourself. No reason for self-cynicism when you you understand the word of God. You are a work in progress, and we all ought to have a t-shirt on all, all day every day that says, don't judge me yet, God's still working on me. It ought to make us humble, and it ought to make us forgiving. It ought to give us patience for everybody we deal with. It ought to help us to be more loving because how loving and patient he must be, he's still working on me. So we're, number one, we're disciples. And number two, we are pilgrims. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world 
anymore. This is like a Sinspiration Day or something. So, hey, we're passing through. I thank God for my material possessions. I thank God for shelter and clothing and food and enjoyment. I thank God for the wonderful ways he blesses us. This is what he did for ancient Israel. He blessed them. He provided for them. He paid their bills. He gave them abundance. He gave them vacations. He gave them breaks, called them to Jerusalem for their feasts. He wants us to enjoy all things. Thanks be to God that richly gives us all things to enjoy. The best of this life is just foreshadowing of the kingdom life and the kingdom blessings he's going to pour out upon us forever and ever and ever. Ephesians 1 and 2 talks about us experiencing the riches of his grace and his kindness towards us for the ages to come. It's going to take him forever. So this world is a short, temporary journey. We are passing through. The suffering of this life cannot be compared to the glory that shall be revealed or will be revealed in us after this life. And it hasn't even entered into our hearts or minds what God has prepared for them that love him. So if you know Jesus, you're a disciple and you're a pilgrim. And if you don't know Jesus, those are the best two reasons trust him, to place your faith in him, to receive him as your savior, and let him come into your life. Give your life to him today, become his student, become his disciple, become his follower, learn the life he's called you and created you to live. Learn your real identity in him, learn your real calling in him, but then learn that there's a life that's far better than this life, and we're just in this life getting ready for it. We're just pilgriming, we're on our way through on our way home. We're homeward bound to the city of God. So we're learning from our master and we're journeying home with our master. We are disciples and we are pilgrims. So it's in that light that we read this Psalm today. And then I'm gonna give you from verses one and two, um, the, uh, the four keys to gladness in sorrowful times. Before I read the Psalm, think about the, you know, it seems like all of the world's information is designed to make us sad and to make us grievous and to burden us and to press us and to tell us how terrible things are. I listen to a couple of news podcasts every morning when I get up and take a walk or work out or get ready for the day. Uh, Throughout the day, I try to catch up on what's going on in the world. And, you know, it's just so, so bad in the, in, in, in the media voices. No, hardly any good news. It's all terrible. It's all corrupt. It's all, you know, the whole world is burning down. If, if all you listen to is the modern news narrative. Why? Because they're selling fear. They're selling clicks. They're selling attention. And nothing gets our attention more than alarm. And so uh, prying our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our brains away from that and getting our eyes back on the city of God and the hills where our help comes from and <clears throat> the presence of God and the purposes and promises of God. It's a really good thing. That's why I'm doing uh, Growing in the Gospel, because you need some good words of encouragement every day, and I do too. And so I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching or teaching you. All right, let's read this psalm, and then let's talk about the four keys of gladness, okay? Read it with me. A song of degrees of David. So we know that David wrote this song. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Whither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sakes, I will now say, peace be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Nine verses, hopeful, looking up, filled with anticipation. So look at verses one and two. I was glad. There's this, there's what we're targeting today. I was glad. Why was he glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, old Jerusalem. So here's a person who is living life, tending sheep, cultivating fields, growing vineyards, surviving, 
going through the routines, the mundane, the monotony, like you and me, getting up, getting ready, going out into the day, doing the work you need to do, coming back exhausted, crashing, getting up the next day, doing the same thing over and over again. And that routine was broken up a couple times, three times a year with this statement, hey, pack up, get ready. It's time to go to the house of the Lord. It's kind of like you feel times a million. It's kind of like you feel when, when someone says, hey, pack your stuff. We're going on vacation. We're going on a trip. We're getting away for a few days. We're going to get refreshed. We're going to re- enjoy some time, some downtime. And I hope you do that if you're able to, um, especially if you have a, a young family or family or marriage. I hope you get time away. I hope you enjoy time. But the gladness. So David says there's gladness that springs up when they said to me, let's, let's go into the house of the Lord. So the first thing that brings gladness is God's presence. In thy presence is fullness of joy. So the practice here is simple, very simple, friend. If, if you're not experiencing gladness, let me ask you this. When's the last time that you just went into the presence of God? Now, the good news is we don't have to go to Jerusalem. We don't have to go up to a temple. We are the temple, okay? But it does require us to silence the voices of our world to get alone with our God and to give our time and our focus and our attention to him. Have you gone into his presence? Hey, this could be also going to church on Sunday morning. I am passionate as a pastor for for the fact that I want Sunday to be the best day of the week for our church family. I want them to anticipate Sunday. When Sunday morning rolls around, I want them so eager to get to church. I want the kids excited, the teens excited, the adults excited, the seniors excited, everybody in between. I want the married, the single, the unmarried, the the, the widowed, the divorced. I want them all excited. I want them all anticipating that they're gonna be loved and nurtured and encouraged in the word of God and the worship and the friendship and the unity. I want them to anticipate being in the presence of God. It should be a taste of heaven. I've had so many people over the uh, last 12 years tell me that they went through a season in their life where Sunday in a broken church, a hurt church, a, a despairing church, a contentious church, a divided church, a legalistic church, where they just said Sunday was the worst day of the week. All it was was beatings and beatings about how bad we were and how disappointed God was. And we could never do enough. We could never give enough. And I just felt so bad. What That's just so, that is so the opposite of what church should be. We're getting a foretaste of glory divine. We are getting a foretaste of heaven itself when we come together with the body of Christ and worship our Savior. So God's presence, going into the presence of God, uh, brings gladness. And you can experience that every day. You can experience that every week with a church family. And I hope you'll find that healthy church family. And don't give up if you've struggled to find that. So first way to have gladness in sorrow, in sorrowful times, is get into God's presence. Uh, Number two, hope and promise in our lives brings gladness. Look forward, not only backward and not only within and not down. Okay, remember the previous psalm, I will lift up my eyes. Anticipation is what produces gladness. So we can grieve over our losses and especially when it's someone we loved, grief is appropriate. I'm not saying that we should never grieve. Grief and lament are built into this journey through life. Loss is built into it. But there's another side to the story. We sorrow not as those that have no hope because Paul said, I don't want you to be worried or anxious, brethren, that those that sleep in Jesus, he will bring with him and we will meet them in the air. There's a grand reunion coming very soon. And those you love that have gone before, I asked our church family last Sunday, how many of you know somebody that's already in heaven? Every hand pretty much went up in the room. And I said, you know, you're going to have a meal with that person in a body, and you're going to know them, they're going to know you. There's going to be an embrace, a a, a welcome home embrace. There's going to be, it's good to see you again, embrace, I missed you. (laughs) I'm so glad you're okay. There's That's going to happen. If you know Jesus and if they knew Jesus, absolutely, that, that's going to happen. So that hope, the hope of our, of our home, our real home, our real destination. I'm preaching on Sunday on the 
millennial kingdom of Jesus. And it's just so good. It's so, it's almost too good to imagine new bodies that can't sin and can't get sick, that never need Advil, uh, that don't age, that are forever youthful, forever energized, forever healthy in a new world that's been totally uh, renovated, restored, renewed under the reign of Jesus and us serving together, ruling with him as a kingdom of priests with, with access to Jesus, access to, Jer- we really are going to Jerusalem, by the way. I mean, we really are. That's a real, as they were going to ancient Jerusalem, we are going to millennial reign Jerusalem, literal Jerusalem, and then we're going to new Jerusalem. So this Psalm is a backward look. It's a present look and it's a future look because this is all about in the truest and fullest fulfillment of this Psalm. It's all about the millennial kingdom and ultimately eternity after that. And so we can anticipate our best life is not now. Our best self is not now. Our best fut- our best living is not now. We're limping. We're, we're wounded. We're, uh, we're enduring. And there's a lot of blessings and good things and joy. I understand that. That's the theme right now is gladness. But it's gladness that coexists with sorrow and loss and grief. It's gladness that coexists and transcends present hardship in that kingdom. It'll just be gladness, total, pure, 100% unadulterated gladness with no downside. So anticipation and promise, you think about that, you dwell on that, you pour your thought, your imagination, your emotion into that, it's going to, it's going to grow gladness in your life. I was glad when they said to me, let us go, (laughs) anticipation, my feet will stand within thy gates. Jerusalem, we're going. My wife, uh, she's a Disney girl. She grew up going to Disneyland as a little girl. And then because we lived in Southern California for 22 years, we ended up taking our kids to Disneyland in Orange County a lot. You could, back then, you could get season's passes for $99, Southern California residents. And, uh, And so we'd, We'd splurge, <coughs> excuse me, with our young family, and and we had a lot of block blackout dates. But my day off was Thursday, and and that was almost never a blackout date. So we we had a lot of good family memories at Disneyland. Moved to the East Coast, and I I told my wife, oh, she she was sad that we wouldn't be able to go to Disney. I said, we'll get you to Disney World. And so, whenever I can surprise her, and I try to get down to Orlando to take her to Disney World, she just becomes a little girl again. And I've learned to love doing it because she loves it. She loves to ride the rides. She loves to see the characters. She loves to hear the music. Um, And uh, and I love the food. (laughs) Let's see. I love the churros and and the ice cream with sprinkles and uh, the cinnamon rolls and the pretzels and the cream cheese pretzels. And yeah, I just I just walk. I just try to walk off whatever I consume. The Mickey ice cream bars. Anyway. I am digressing. My point is, when she knows we're going to take a trip, she anticipates it. And that anticipation creates gladness. And so it can be when you think about heaven and the kingdom, you're not going to lose anything and you're going to regain everything. Your biggest and deepest and most profound dreams are all going to come true. So God's presence brings gladness. Hope and promise brings gladness. Number three, our final destination brings gladness. Um, Knowing that you have a final destination in this journey, you have a purpose, you have meaning, you have value, and you really are going somewhere. The narrative of the world cannot possibly produce gladness. Apart from God, apart from Jesus, the narrative is simply this. You live, you die, you cease to exist. You came from nothing, you're going to nothing. You mean nothing. Your life has no value. So there is no hope. There is no real reason to be glad. So just make it up and pretend. The Bible doesn't say pretend. God never says pretend. God says, no, face reality right now. This world is hard. This life is hard. In the world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. That's not fantasy. That's truth. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Jesus right now, in our sense of time, in a timeless place, 
is preparing a place for us and promised he will come again and receive us to himself that where he is, we will be also. So where that is, you have a home with no mortgage at no cost forever, and it will never deteriorate. You'll never have to fix the AC. You'll never have to re-roof it or repave the driveway. You'll never have to cut the grass. You'll never have to you'll you'll never have to repair a single thing or pay for a single thing. You will have the most wonderful existence in the most amazing destination. And it will be totally incorruptible. It will be yours forever. So you every step you take and every day we live, we are that much closer to the city of God and to our true home. And that brings gladness. Our, I have a final destination, and that final destination I can, I can dream about, I can look forward to, and I can prepare for. And that means every purpose of today has a preparatory component to it that produces gladness and motivation, a motivational joy to keep going. Don't give up. Don't get impatient. Don't despair. Press on. I have a man in my church named Bill. He's a dear friend of mine. He probably watches these videos. And uh, he tells me all the time, Pastor, press on, press on. I just love Bill. He's been such an encouragement over these many years. So God's presence brings gladness, hope, and promise in our lives today that transcends the sorrowful narrative. That brings gladness. Our final destination, we're going somewhere. We have purpose and meaning and value. That brings gladness. And number four, Worship today brings gladness. Worship. What are they going to do when they go into the house of the Lord? They're going to worship. These feasts were celebrations. There was music. There was dancing. There was food. There was fellowship and festivity. And it was glorious. It was wonderful. Even in its corruptible state, it was a wonderful experience. And the children of Israel, the people of Israel, cherished these times. It's one of the reasons there's a wailing wall, there's a western wall, because they can't have access right now to Temple Mount. And how they would like to reconstruct their temple and reconstitute their sacrificial system and reconstitute their feasts and their festivals. But the best they can do is that courtyard area right by the western wall. And if you've ever been there, you know what I'm about to say. It is, when you get up close to the wall, it is a sorrowful place. When you go into the tunnels where they're praying, there's a men's space and a women's space. And each of these, there's an outdoor and an indoor space that goes up under the tunnels. And, uh, and it's very somber. It's very sobering. It's very um, eye-opening and heart-wrenching. But when you get outside of the prayer area, there's a vast courtyard and it is one of the most festive places in all of Jerusalem. Uh, many days of the week, there's bar mitzvahs and people dancing and parading their children who are coming into uh, manhood. And, um, and, and, and every time I've been there, there have been school groups, Jewish kids, and they'll get in a huge circle and they'll, they'll, they'll dance and sing. I've got videos of it. And uh, one, one of the times, the, the leader of the group pulled me into the circle and <laughs> the kids were, I mean, it's just it's just singing and dancing and celebration, even even as an oppressed and divided and a city filled with tension today. So worship. And one day we're going to be, we're going to have access to, um, to Jesus in person in his throne at Jerusalem. And we're going to have total access to go worship him. And at least once a year, we're going to all gather in that millennial kingdom and go to Jerusalem and do what this psalm is talking about. I can only imagine how awesome that's going to be. Um, but you know, right now today, you can worship him today. You can, and and goodness, with our phones and our earbuds, we, I, we can go on walks or bike rides and pull up songs of worship and, and take a walk in nature or I mean, we can, we can seclude into times of worship and we can gather with our church families and friends and, and celebrate times of worship. We have what we call nights of worship at Emmanuel and they're just, I think they're the best services of the whole year. They're just unbelievable. They're wonderful and, uh, and, and they're celebratory. They're full of joy and sometimes we'll have pie or desserts afterwards and just make, make it a great, great time. So yeah, today you can, whatever's going on in your life, whatever's going on in your world, you can find a place 
where it's you and God, and you can enjoy his presence. And you can bury your heart into the hopes and, and promises that he, he pours out in scripture, and that can put gladness into your life. And you can stop and think about the fact that you have purpose and meaning today and focus and direction, and you are going someplace. You have a final destination. You will be conformed to the image of Christ. You will be brought home into the city of God in the place that Jesus has prepared for you. And, and then today you can worship him. You can give praise and thanks to him and you can celebrate him and express your love to him. And the very act of worship will produce gladness in your life. So there it is, friend. Four keys to gladness, his presence. Get alone with him. Hope and promise, get alone with his word and his promises. Our final destination, think about home, long for home. And number four, worship. Get alone and worship him today. I promise you the presence of God will transcend all the sorrowful narratives of this present moment. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you'll leave a comment or post a question. I would love for you to share the video with a friend and invite them to take the journey. And I know that many of you are not subscribers to Growing in the Gospel. And so I hope that you'll click subscribe and stick around and drop in and let me encourage you with the Word of God as you uh, take your own pilgrimage with Jesus. Have a great day. Happy journeying today. I'm praying for you all. We'll see you tomorrow.